Good morning. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming, but hosting special virtual events, including this one. You can learn more about our upcoming virtual events or by becoming a member, visiting commonwealthclub.org. We are grateful for the generous support of our members and donors and hope you will consider making a donation today um, online or you can text 415-329-4231. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and share videos like this one to your friends and family. During our program, we will have time for your questions towards the end. Please submit those in the chat box. I'm Patty James, nutritionist and culinary educator. I've found my home as Chief Innovation Officer at Fugle Incorporated, a personalized nutrition company. I have been part of the Commonwealth Club's member-led forum dealing with health and medicine for 12 years. And I am proud and honored to be sharing today's program with Dr. Lloyd Miner. Dr. Miner, MD, is a scientist, surgeon, and academic leader. He is the Dean of Stanford University School of Medicine, a position he has held since December, 2012. As Dean, Dr. Miner plays an integral role in setting strategy for the clinical, research, and teaching missions of Stanford Medicine, an academic medical center that includes the Stanford University School of Medicine, Stanford Healthcare, Stanford Children's Health, and Lucille Packard's Children's Hospital. Dr. Miner led the first integrated strategic planning process for Stanford Medicine. With his leadership, Stanford Medicine had established a strategic vision to lead the biochemical revolution in precision health, predict, prevent, and cure. Precisely, a fundamental shift to more proactive and personalized healthcare that empowers people to lead healthy lives. With more than 140 published articles and chapters, Dr. Miner is an expert in balance and inner ear disorders. In the medical community, he is perhaps best known for his discovery of superior canal dehiscence syndrome, a debilitating disorder characterized by sound or pressure-induced dizziness. He subsequently developed a surgical procedure that corrects the problem and alleviates symptoms. In 2012, Dr. Miner was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Miner. Thank you very much, Patty. It's great to be with you today. Good. Well, thank you. And I didn't know anything about um, superior canal dehiscence until about a week ago. And, and uh, now I know a whole lot more about it than I ever thought it, I would. It was very fascinating, really interesting. So congratulations on that. You certainly helped a lot of people not seeing the bases on their counters rotate. That must have been a horrible thing to for those poor folks. And thankfully, you fixed it for them. So here's what we're going to do. So the questions... We have questions, we have 13 or 14 questions, and then at the end, of course, we will take um, questions from the audience. So in your book, and I quote, precision health draws on the enablers of precision medicine, genomics, big data science, regenerative medicine, but applies them in a predictive and proactive way. While precision medicine implies that individuals who get sick are treated precisely, Precision Health is focused on a holistic approach to keeping people healthy through targeted interventions and stopping disease before it starts. It seeks to understand the features of disease that explain why some people get sick when others do not, and which treatments, tests, and lifestyle changes will help prevent disease in each individual. When it isn't possible to altogether prevent a disease, Precision Health seeks to improve diagnostics, such that diseases are detected much earlier and treated more effectively. So my question is, as part of everything that I just wrote from your book, quoted, you talk about patient-centered, participatory, preeminent, and then you talk about high touch and high tech. Would you explain these terms and concepts and how they affect us? And if possible, would you weave in uh, how these concepts are available to people from all walks of life and socioeconomic levels? I know it's a big question. Well, thank you, Patty. I think the way to think about the difference between uh, precision medicine and precision health is that precision medicine is about sick care. It's about individualized, personalized treatments for severe acute diseases like cancer and heart disease. Not one size fits all, but personalized to 
our genomic makeup to other characteristics of our overall health. So precision medicine is about sick care. Precision health is about health care. How do we keep ourselves healthy for a longer period of time? How do we prevent diseases from occurring in the first place? And when we can't prevent diseases entirely, how do we detect them much earlier and therefore treat them more effectively? Now, for sure, when we get sick, when if we have cancer, if we have a heart, if we have heart disease, we want precision medicine. We don't want a cookie cutter approach to therapeutics. We want an approach to therapeutics that's individualized to our genetic makeup, that's individualized to the characteristics of our disease. But wouldn't it be great if we present if we prevented that disease in the first place? And that's the goal of precision health to predict, prevent, and cure precisely. It is a message that um, I think is embedded within a lot of things that have begun in various different ways in the healthcare community. I think there's been a gradual realization and push towards prevention, but there needs to be a rapid acceleration in that approach towards prevention. The US healthcare delivery system is fantastic if you have a severe acute disease. And places like Stanford, tertiary quaternary care academic medical centers, we're pushing the boundaries of the treatment of severe acute diseases every day. We don't wanna back away from that for one minute, but we do want to embrace the notion and make real the notion that we can prevent a lot of these diseases from occurring in the first place. You raise a very important question about um, the predisposition for disease and how much of disease and ill health is associated with social determinants of health. This is one thing I talk about in the book. You know, roughly 70% of the determinants of health, or you could look at it in the opposite way, the determinants of disease, roughly 70% come from the social, behavioral, and environmental factors um, that each of us finds ourselves in. 30% of health is related to the medical care we receive and our genetics, roughly 30%. So 70%, the majority of our health is related to social, behavioral, and environmental factors. Typically in the United States, we've done very little in the past to address these social, behavioral, environmental factors. And I have to say also, those of us at academic medical centers have done very little to address these factors. That needs to change moving forward. It's a sad fact that the best, that the zip code in which we live is a better determinant of our health than is our genetic code. And we need to change that. We have the ability to change it. COVID-19 has really underscored these disparities in health in healthcare. If you look at a, a map of where the highest prevalence of COVID-19 has been, it that map will correspond very accurately to places that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, communities that are socio, socioeconomically disadvantaged. And we need to change that moving forward. COVID-19 has underscored the importance of changing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and then we're gonna, I have a question about social determinants uh, health in a couple minutes, so we'll get back to that topic. But in your book, you talk about uh, the decision tree and its orientation towards prevention. What's the decision tree? The decision tree is really a notion that was um, first inter introduced by um, uh, the former editor of Wired Magazine, Thomas Goetz. He wrote a, a wonderful book, um, which I think in many ways laid the foundation for precision health. And it talks about that, um, it, again, it gets to this notion that there should be an individualized approach to prevention. Um, I may have a propensity for some diseases that other people don't have that propensity. If there are things that I should be doing, for example, to maintain my health more effectively, then I should know what interventions, what, you know, how I can change my diet, how I might change my exercise patterns. We know generically that observing a healthy diet, that getting regular exercise is helpful, but it differs in terms of, of, of people and individuals, genetic makeup and, and, and other factors. And Getz was, I, I think, one of the first to focus on this and getting away from one size fits all in prevention, 
to really individualizing and tailoring prevention to um, to the, a variety of different factors unique to each of us as an individual. In addition, I talk about a number of other things that I think led up to uh, our focus in Stanford Medicine, and really this is our collective vision of precision health at Stanford Medicine, and how that vision came about. It talks about how in, in 2014, uh, Susan Desmond Hellman, who was at that time, pardon me, 2013, Susan Desmond Hellman, who was that time the chancellor at UCSF, hosted a conference on precision medicine. It was the first time that I'd really heard those two words used, precision medicine. And then later, President Obama embraced that as a national initiative. Uh, it really entered into the dialogue nationally. And, and there are lots of examples of the effectiveness of precision medicine our ability to treat many cancers much more effectively than we, than we treated them 10 years ago. That ability has primarily come about because we don't use one size fits all therapies for a cancer like breast cancer. We use therapies tailored to the receptor status of the tumor, to other overall health factors of the person who has the tumor. And that's led to dramatic improvements in outcome. And that, that has been the traditional focus of precision medicine. Our, I think our, one of the things we've contributed here is to look, yes, acknowledge that and look beyond it. How can we really design prevention and diagnostic uh, paradigms that do a better job of identifying disease earlier or predicting it or preventing it altogether through, again, what Thomas Getz talked about as being the decision tree. Okay, well, it was fascinating. So your book is very much an ode to Stanford University, and good heavens, rightly so. Uh, please explain, um, and again, again, another big question, please explain the many departments under your guidance and how they work together for the greater good. An example would be um, so would be wonderful so people understand, you know, the complexities of, of Stanford and on and all the aspects of healthcare. We'll need to understand, um, or we'll need to add a few more hours if, if you, you, this is gonna be general, obviously. So um, I'm not sure. So in other words, how your different departments work and, and work together. And the fact that, um, so there's a, been a lot of companies, uh, commercialization that have come from your studies. That can be confusing for people. Um, maybe they're curious about conflicts of interest or any of that. So um, and, and possibly um, using, because it's in the, you know, it's an, an important factor in the healthcare and in, in disease care in this country, obesity and poor nutrition, an example. And you could, for that, you can weave in genomics and fitness trackers, and then you can maybe weave in BJ Fogg from, you know, and his behavior. And so there's so many different uh, aspects of all diseases. And Stanford is, is, a, is amazing uh, how you, you know, all the different departments under your guidance. So, so can you touch on how you all work together and explain a little bit the companies that come out of your work? Sure. Thank well, you. we are, we at Stanford are who we are because of our people and there's nothing more important uh, for us. There's nothing more important for our mission uh, than the people who come here to do research, the, who come here to learn and become leaders themselves, the people who every day devote their lives to, uh, to our mission and to the endeavor in patient care research and teaching here at Stanford. We have over 2,700 faculty. Uh, they're distributed among departments and institutes. I think what makes it all work is that there is a spirit of collaboration here and there's a spirit of unity of purpose and mission uh, that energizes me and I think all of us every day. We are an academic medical center that is very much a part of Stanford University. We're located on the campus of Stanford University. We're right across the street from the engineering school, uh, from the biology department, the chemistry department. That makes collaboration, that plus the atmosphere of collegiality makes collaboration much more facile than at many of our peer institutions. And the advances in biomedicine today almost always are not coming from a single discipline and not coming from a single laboratory. They're coming from the fusion of disciplines, the fusion of technologies, and, and the melding of different talents and approaches to tackle really complex problems. I think Stanford, time and time again, has shown that we're a great place for doing that. 
The big change, I think, over the past eight to 10 years for Stanford has been the growth in our clinical enterprise. We've opened two new hospitals, wonderful new hospitals here on our campus, Palo Alto. We opened our new children's hospital about three and a half years ago. We opened our new um, adult hospital just this past November. And I'm so thankful that we did because our ability to respond to COVID-19 was dramatically enhanced and improved because we did have uh, this wonderful new hospital facility open. By having new facilities, we've been able to expand our inpatient activities. We've also built a network of care. And we can really then take the entire spectrum from fundamental discovery. So the most basic research, and I talk quite a bit about basic discovery-driven research in the book, because that's the bedrock, the foundation of everything we do is the fundamental science underlying uh, the biology of disease. We can take fundamental science, we can translate it into new therapies, new preventative strategies in patients, and then we can deliver that care in our delivery system. And it goes both ways. We, we can identify problems in our patients that spark the interest of our scientists, our clinician scientists, our basic scientists, that then lead to new discoveries. And it, it's a self-reinforcing and mutually beneficial cycle. That is the process of discovery to translation from observation of, of, and definition of problems in patients back driving the discovery engine. It's very much what I did earlier in my career in describing what you mentioned before, superior canal dehiscence syndrome, where it was really my background and ability as a systems neuroscientist studying the balance system, the vestibular system, coupled with being a clinician that enabled me to identify this disorder in patients, uh, to define its origin, and ultimately uh, develop a surgical treatment that's beneficial in alleviating the symptoms in the vast majority of people. And we want to provide an environment here that enables all of our faculty to be engaged in a similar process of discovery, translation, and patient care. Uh, so that, that's a little bit about our, our organizational structure here in Academic Medical Center, very much a part of this great re research university. And I think that COVID-19 has pointed out very clearly the value of a university like Stanford having an Academic Medical Center. Not only have we provided care to people in the Stanford community and broadly speaking, people in Northern California, but also we're doing the research that ultimately one day is gonna enable us to conquer this virus uh, through understanding the immune response, through a variety of different studies of therapeutics and just advancing in a fundamental way, the science of virology, uh, which, which we so desperately need to do because I'm concerned that, I'm confident we're going to defeat this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But I'm also confident that it's not going to be the last time we encounter a pathogen like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we need to be a lot better prepared than we have been in the past. Now, let me touch on the translation aspect and on starting companies. The spirit of entrepreneurialism is very much alive and well at Stanford. It, it, it goes back, no pun intended, to the DNA of Stanford. And in fact, biotechnology in a very real way began here at, at Stanford with uh, recombinant DNA um, and Paul Berg winning the Nobel Prize for that work. And then the, the path breaking, path fight, uh, defining work done by Stanley Cohen and Herb Boyer um, in really being able to clone genes and then be able to make protein uh, from cloned genes. And, and that led to the birth of biotechnology. And Genentech was one of the first companies to spin out uh, from, uh, from that fundamental advance. And there've been many, many others. So what, what commercialization enables us to do is to scale. We're a research university and an academic medical center. And uh, we're, we're not set up to produce large quantities of an antibody or large quantities of a drug, or even to take things through all the different steps required to make sure that we're getting a safe and effective therapeutic or diagnostic to people. Our role is to do the research. It's, it's to do the groundbreaking studies, to demonstrate the proof of concept, to show that something will work, and then to enable that to go forward and be commercialized through industry. There are a variety of different safeguards that are put in place to protect for, for conflict. 
one of the most fundamental ones is uh, disclosure. And that is we're required to disclose any commercial interests that we have. Those are monitored and tracked regularly, but transparency is such an important part in everything we do. It's also critically important in maintaining the public trust in, in the independence and the validity of the work that we do. So disclosure, conflict mitigation, all are extremely important in, um, in, in maintaining an ecosystem that encourages entrepreneurialism, that enables faculty who wish to, um, to commercialize a technology, a scientific advance, enables them to do so, but also protects the integrity of the institution in the process. Yes, I was impressed. Uh, you had a couple pages, I think, uh, about how to make sure there are no conflicts of interest. It, w it was impressive, um, everything you do, because a lot of companies have spinned out of, of Stanford. So it was, it was, it was very interesting uh, to read all about all the safeguards in place. So that was great. So I want to, because I didn't mention this in the beginning, this is Dr. Miner's book. It's Discovering Precision Health. You can see all my sticky notes here. I tried to hide them, but um, a fascinating book. And we are just absolutely touching on the tip of the iceberg with what we're discussing today. So I recommend that you all purchase um, Discovering Precision Health. And maybe Dr. Miner, you can come back in six months after everybody's read it, and they'll have a lot more questions. I'd also like to remind you that the Commonwealth Club uh, relies on your donations. We're very grateful for your generous support of our members and donors and hope you will consider making a donation online or again, and I believe that they have this phone number um, on the program, but it's 415-329-4231. You can text donate. So, um, okay, on the notes that we were just talking about a moment ago, Stanford's um, Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research has launched three companies focused on asthma. One for, I think this is really interesting, one for prevention, one for cure, one for treatment. Uh, you have done the same multi tiered approach for other health issues as well. And I think we've covered that a little bit. There's some overlap between these last two questions. So, but, um, so if you would please talk about the multi-tiered approach um, uh, to cancer or diabetes or mental health. And that's a big question, I, I know. And, and then I have a, a segue back into um, social determinants of health after that. So, you know, your multi-tiered approach with, um, for all your departments, prevention, cure, treatment. Yes, thank you. I think one feature common to all is that people at Stanford, those of us at Stanford, are attracted to the really difficult problems. We don't tend to be attracted to the incremental type of problems. We're attracted to the problems that have stumped other people, the problems that require a multidisciplinary approach in order to solve them, uh, the problems that will have maximal impact when they are solved. And the examples that you mentioned in diseases like allergies, food allergies, asthma, those diseases share a common backbone and that is disorders of the immune system. And there has been a lot of focus at Stanford over the past many years on immunology. I'm proud of all of our groups at Stanford. Our human immunology group has had profound impact in understanding vaccine response, extraordinarily important, now as we move towards the development of a SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, vaccine and leveraging the resources in the human immune monitoring core has enabled pulmonologists, people who study lung diseases, people who study food allergies, people who study asthma. It's given a common resource, a common base of knowledge and, and also a, a huge biobank of well-characterized specimens and people who've had their immune system studied in enormous detail, it's a resource then that can be used to approach a variety of different diseases, all of which share a common immunological uh, basis in some way. I see that resource, that human immune monitoring core and its various related resources as underpinning advances, certainly in asthma and allergy, but also in cancer and autoimmune diseases in a variety of other conditions where fundamentally these are diseases
diseases of the immune system gone awry. It's the immune system either failing to detect an abnormal cell or the immune system becoming overly active in a way that it destroys the body it isn't supposed to destroy, the body it's supposed to protect. And our knowledge of human immunology still has a long way to go, but I think enormous progress is being made here to understand human immunology and then apply it uh, to treating or preventing these diseases that, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I had a conversation, um, well, a short conversation with Dr. Uh, Rishi Manchanda, and he's kind of known uh, as the upstreamist. We talked about that earlier. He, back to bringing in the allergies and, and asthma center, and he talked about it at a conference, I think I was at, where I met him briefly. He talked about a child with asthma, and um, he went upstream, you know, went to the family's home, and he discovered mold. So I, th I always use that as an example of upstream, because, um, you know, um, he took the time, and that's my next question here, to, to, to do that, to go and see where this started before that little one came to his office. Now, <laughs> physician burnout is, is a big, doctors are, are overworked, stressed, they're not going to have time to get in their car and go to somebody's house. So if you could talk about that upstream, and also uh, I've been taking some courses lately on the community health workers and the, the major success that they've had in other countries. And, and that would be an ideal um, chore uh, to help the doctor to, to do the upstream work. So if you could um, you know, talk about upstream and um, and possibly bringing in, which by the way, it's not regulated, as you know, community health workers are not regulated in, in California, but they are in other states, Texas, one of them, I think Massachusetts is another, Florida, I believe. So um, if you could talk about upstream and community health workers, I'd be very interested. Certainly, I think that one thing that COVID-19 has pointed out very painfully is how we have to rebuild our public health infrastructure in the United States. 30, 40 years ago, it was much more robust. The public health infrastructure was much more robust than it is today because we were still fighting off some very deadly and prevalent infectious diseases. Thanks to vaccines and other eradication measures, many of those infectious diseases are now controlled. But Polio. We, right. In Africa. Polio, right. <laughs> yeah. um, Yay. Right. Measles, for example, except when people don't vaccinate. So there's a lot of success to celebrate, but we took our eye off the ball in a sense. We didn't completely eradicate infectious diseases, as we certainly are aware in the COVID-19 world. And now we need to rebuild that public health infrastructure. You know, a virus like the SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't know the difference between one county and the next, one state and the next, or even one country in the next. And we have to have a much more unified approach to public health and to prevention than we've had in the past. The other thing to follow up on and a point you mentioned before about asthma and social determinants of health, one of the examples related to asthma that I talk about in the book, it, a very nice study done by University of Southern California faculty a few years ago, they looked at the incidence of childhood asthma in Los Angeles in the 1990s and then and in the 2010s, 20 year time span. What they found was that the numbers, number of cases of childhood asthma in Los Angeles went down dramatically during that period of time. Now the major change during that period of time is that the air in Los Angeles is much clearer, cleaner uh, now or when the study was done than it was 20, 25 years before. The genetics of the population hasn't changed appreciably. Medical care may have changed some, but the overwhelmingly important change has been cleaning up the air. It's a powerful example of how environmental factors, social factors play such an important role in, in, in determining our health. Yeah. So uh, social determinants, I've had the pleasure of hosting um, Dr. Anthony Eiton, which you probably know Tony Eiton, and his 10-year, uh, $1 billion uh, study, Building Healthy Communities, where he looked at 
14 communities in the state of California. I hosted him when he'd been in this about two years and then again in the last year, last fall, um, for an update. So he talks about, as you do, it's your zip code, uh, not your genetic code. And I know, again, like he just said, that Stanford's working on this as well. So with that in mind, again, I go to conferences, quite a few conferences, there's always so much to learn. And a hot topic is always all this siloed information. You know, Dr. Eiton and, and this incredible billion dollar study of social determinants of health and how to improve uh, those aspects in the various communities. You're working on social determinants of health and you just mentioned USC, but how do we take all this information and de-silo it, if there is such a word as de-siloed, and, and make it so, you know, uh, like an open source, you know, here's what we discovered. How, how do we get all this amazing information and not have it not available to the average person? It's because everybody has their, you know, it's Stanford study. It's their, you know, how do we do that? And it's not just social determinants of health. This is, uh, happens all the time that all these, all this great information that is just not cohesive for the public. Exactly. It's a complicated problem, of course, yeah. a great question, complicated problem. I think one way we do it is to get information to policymakers. And uh, one of the things that we've been focused on here in thinking about our health policy studies and, and how we can have more impact is what type of information do policymakers need? One of the things that we're doing now in the midst of, of COVID-19, uh, supported by uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is the collaboration between uh, or among UCSF, Stanford, and the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub to look at the prevalence of COVID-19 in various communities in the Bay Area. That information, the information from that study is being sent directly to public health officials in the counties in the Bay Area. Oh. Trying to, in, the study is still, we're still enrolling people, we're still getting data, this study is going to be on for a, ongoing for a while. Unfortunately, I think the virus is going to be with us for a while also. But making sure that public health experts get the data in real time that indicates the prevalence of infection in their communities. There are a variety of different ways that data get reported. We, we've seen, again, back to the need to rejuvenate, rebuild our public health infrastructure in the United States. We've seen a lot of problems with data reporting in our state, in the country. Uh, everyone I'm confident is, is well-intentioned. It's just we didn't have the information technology backbone needed uh, to collate the data, bring it together, and then get it to policymakers in a timely fashion. I, I'm convinced that the vast majority of policymakers are well-intentioned. And one of our responsibilities, I think, is as a research university academic medical center is to provide information that can drive intelligent decision making. That's something we're, we're focused on in COVID-19. I think it, it expands much more broadly as, as we think about health policy in, in general in the country where there is a need for a lot more focus, a lot more data to drive informed decisions. Yeah. Well, so let's shift to mental health, which is, you know, a, a huge topic right now as well. It should be. So regarding mental health, explain uh, your human connectome project and how Stanford is involved and what that is. The human connectome project is somewhat analogous to the human genome project. With the human genome project, we mapped the human genome, an enormous scientific technological achievement. Now, the goal of the Human Connectome Project is to map all the connections in the brain, a daunting task, but one that technologically now we have the ability to conduct in ways that we didn't even five years ago, thanks to advanced imaging techniques and techniques that continue to evolve and, uh, and expand in terms of impact. By understanding the connectivity of the brain, we're gonna be able to better understand mental illness, better understand what circuits and pathways in the brain go awry during mental illness. We firmly believe that there's a biological basis for diseases that have been poorly characterized in the past. 
we talk, I talk a lot in the book about depression and how depression is a term, obviously it's very commonly used, very commonly made diagnosis in the United States. As a term though, it's not nearly precise enough because it doesn't get to origin and it doesn't necessarily just the diagnosis, generic diagnosis of depression does not lead to informed treatment recommendations in many cases. And this is why oftentimes today in a, uh, one of the faculty that I interview in the book, Amit Etkin talks about, it's almost best to define a disease, a group of diseases like depression today, based upon what therapeutics work, because in that way, we have some understanding of the mechanism and ultimately have a better way at getting at effective therapeutics rather than using broad catch-all terms that don't give much of an indication about etiology or nor do they directly inform therapeutics. So, okay, um, shifting to pharmaceuticals now. Regarding pharmaceutical drugs, you mentioned that you use the medication to define the patient as opposed to using the patient to define the medication. What does this mean? And can you give us a, a real life example? Sure, that's, that's a quote from um, the faculty member I mentioned, uh, Amit Etkin. And what he's referring to there is that there are, if we take depression as an example, there are some forms of depression, some people who suffer from what we generically call depression that respond very well to a specific group of therapeutics. Other people don't respond at all, but do respond to other therapeutics. If you lump them all in together and do what's called a meta-analysis, so you study outcomes from hundreds or thousands of different studies, you reach the conclusion that when lumped all in together, pharmacotherapy or drug therapy for depression offers very little benefit. And that's because you've got apples and oranges and peaches and pears all together in that basket. And by defining it a disease or de defining a patient's disease based upon how they respond to a medication and looking for indications associated with that response, we're more act we'll be better able to accurately treat future pe people who have a similar manifestation of what we call depression. Okay. So peering into the future, you talk about what medicine can learn from aviation. I thought that was kind of a, a, a fun few paragraphs. Explain what medicine can, can learn from aviation. Yes, thank you. Uh, my uh, dear friend and colleague who, who passed away just recently, Dr. Sam Gambier, who was the chair of our radiology department, uh, Sam used to draw this analogy a lot. And I think it's a very appropriate analogy, and that is... 20, 25 years ago, the engines on a jet plane, the, the fuselage of the plane, all went through routine maintenance on a fixed scheduled basis. Uh, and that enabled most problems to be detected. Today, that's no longer the case. When you and I were flying on jet planes, I doubt uh, any of us <laughs> are doing that a great deal anymore, but when, when we were and when we will in the future, those engines are being monitored hundreds of times a minute uh, by remote monitoring stations on Earth. The real-time performance of the engine is con engines are constantly being tracked. Most of the time, outside the conscious awareness of the pilots, because most of the time the engines are functioning just fine. But that monitoring enables very early indicators of a problem to be detected, and then for that to drive the maintenance of that engine in a way tailored to the performance of the engine and not just a generic performance characteristic. Wouldn't it be great if we had something similar for human health? In other words, that each of us was able to monitor our health in the background, not taking time out from our day to do special things, just being monitored. And then if there was a problem detected, giving us an indication that we needed to get it checked out or an indication of a specific test or procedure that we needed to have done. That's within our grasp today. We have a lot more ability today to monitor human health than we did just a decade ago. Unfortunately, we're still not implementing it as much as we could. And we also haven't packaged or provided these ongoing health monitoring systems in ways that make adoption by you, by me, uh, realistic given 
our busy daily lives. And that's what needs to occur. It, it broadly speaking is under the heading of the digital health revolution and how technology is able to transform health and healthcare delivery. You know, technology has transformed every other aspect of our lives radically, except for health and healthcare. The way you and I order goods and services, the way we perform financial transactions, are vastly different today than they were in the past. Yet still, although we're starting to schedule appointments online, we still interact with the doctor's office with other healthcare providers on the phone very frequently. Those of us in healthcare delivery still send medical information by fax. Yeah. Hospitals and doctor's offices are one of the few places today where you can still find fax machines other than the computer history museum. <laughs> we need to move away from that. We need for sure, we need to protect privacy and data security, but we need to embrace the technology and data transformation that has changed other aspects of our lives. It can also change our interactions with our health and healthcare in ways that help us to stay healthy, but we need to embrace the changes that, that are needed in order for that to happen. Um. Well, prevention, uh, being in the nutrition world, is of particular interest to me. I was happy to see you. You have a, a lot of information on um, on prevention in your book. And metabolic disease, as an example, is it, free. Com- it's preventable for the most part. And you offer a whole chapter again on prevention, complex topic. I know that, but would you try to summarize what Stanford is doing to try to help this? Um, and if you bring in other departments, you, you mentioned a little bit ago policy. Um, I have a good friend, Dr. Robert Lustig, and he's a doctor, but he went back to law school to see how, I think he put it to me one day, how to come in the back door to try to get policy changed and get all this junk out of our food system. So um, how are you helping with um, with prevention and all your departments? Like again, mentioning BJ Fogg and behavior, or are you bringing in your law department and your marketing, all those to, to solve this um, massive problem requires a, a lot of moving parts. How are you doing all that? <laughs> there are several ways that we're leading in the area of prevention. Uh, let me mention one to start out with. We have a center at Stanford called the Clinical Excellence Research Center that collaborates extensively with our human-centered AI initiative at Stanford University. One of the things that this collaboration between CERC and the human-centered AI program has done is to how to make the in-home environment an intelligent, in the background monitoring environment. For example, for people, older people who are living in assisted living, we want to maintain their independence for as long as possible, but we also want them to be able to get help immediately if they need it. It's now possible to monitor using infrared video, so not actually imaging an individual, but using infrared video to very accurately detect a fall in, in an assisted living environment, and then to summon help immediately if a fall is detected. Imagine having a system like that being used constantly to monitor the well-being of people in assisted living, where they can get the help that they need, still have the independence that they need and deserve, but get the help that they need immediately. That's being piloted today, as well as pilots in areas like, we know that a common cause of the transmission of infections in hospital is the failure of us as healthcare providers to wash our hands. And so a similar method is being used to monitor hand washing sinks outside of ICU rooms to make sure that people going in and out of the rooms have washed or sanitized their hands before they go in and out of the rooms. These are the types of AI driven intelligent interventions uh, that can dramatically improve health and healthcare. There are other approaches to prevention too. You're a nutritionist, you know that diet plays an extraordinarily important role in determining our overall health how we can study healthy diets. I talk about one example in in the book, one of our faculty members um, is studying, looking at obesity in the Latinx community among Hispanic, uh, among Hispanic adolescents uh, and where obesity is very high, almost 40% 
of adolescents in the Latinx community in our region are obese. And what they have been doing is looking at a simple intervention like offering to replace the cooking and eating utensils in the home with smaller utensils, reasoning that if people cook less food, then they'll eat less food. And that intervention is being studied. And, and thus far, it seems to be effective. Also looking at after school exercise programs back when kids were still able to go to school in public. There are a variety of different things that can be done, leveraging resources in a clever way that we already have available to us, and then bringing them to the benefit of others. Um, back to food a little bit, and you know, uh, and the fact that I think it's pretty well known that doctors don't receive a lot of nutrition and um, education as part of their uh, their college experience. But m the point is, how would they possibly? I mean, it, it just seems like they should be working together. And I don't know how we could expect a doctor to know every and all the details of nutrition when they are doing their regular, if that's the right word, doctor duty. So it just seems to me like maybe we should um, have a nutritionist, di dietitians, or uh, whatever, in, um, in with the doctor as a matter of course, because the doctor can't be expected to dial down in nutrition as much as, you know, as um, I think we're expecting them to know. What do you think about that? One theme in medical education today is to train the physician to be a valued and valuable member of a team. Mm -hmm. When I was in medical school, we were trained as individuals. And certainly there's a base of knowledge and skills that every one of us needs to have as a physician. But increasingly, our ability to deliver outstanding care to our patients, our ability to lead in the transformation of biomedicine as we know needs to occur, that ability is directly linked to our ability to work in teams, effectively in teams. Nutritionists play an extraordinarily valuable role in teams, as do pharmacists, for example, physical therapists, our nursing professionals. Uh, we really have to be collaborative and interactive and team members with our nursing professionals. And that's now really driving medical education much more than it was in the past. And I think it will continue to in the future, particularly as we look at transforming disciplines like primary care medicine, where there are a variety of different models of primary care today. But one model involves empowering and enabling advanced practice providers to practice to the top of their license and have the physician be a partner with those advanced practice providers to provide guidance, to provide input, but also to extend the reach of the physician in ways that make the overall care delivery experience for the patient much more effective than it was when a person was seeing his or her physician for 15 minutes during an office visit, for example. Well, that's great. I like that team approach. I mean, that just makes complete sense. So on the topic again of prevention, I, I can't help thinking about our children. And I know you, like you mentioned, the Children's Hospital, and I've worked with quite a few children. And there's a lot of wonderful programs out there talking about the, our nation's children. And you mentioned 40% for the Latinx children, uh, obese. So how specifically is Stanford helping our children um, to live? And I know you can't talk about a child without talking about their parents. So family-centered with the focus on children. How, what, what are your programs and how are you working on that really important topic right now? I'm so pleased that as a part of our Academic Medical Center, we have a preeminent children's hospital, Lucille Packard uh, Children's Hospital. And we also have a preeminent healthcare delivery network for children, Stanford Children's Health. And our three entities in Stanford Medicine, Stanford Children's Health, Stanford Healthcare, the School of Medicine, we work in close partnership to make sure that we're bringing the very best science to our patients, that we're reaching out into communities to deliver outstanding care. On the children's side, there are a number of different things that Stanford Children's Health is doing very closely coordinated with collaborating with our faculty who have a passionate interest at addressing healthcare disparities in general, but particularly the pernicious effects of healthcare disparities in children. 
from vans that we send out in communities to provide care, to doing screening for diseases such as COVID-19, um, to providing testing for COVID-19 in communities where that testing has not been available in the past. These are all activities that our healthcare delivery system is very much focused on doing. As well as, and I write about this in the book also, we're bringing the latest cutting edge therapies to the benefit of people who entrust their care to us. The fifth floor of our wonderful new children's hospital is entirely devoted to immunocompromised children. Children who are receiving chemotherapy for cancer, children who are receiving the most advanced stem cell transplants, uh, cellularly engineered uh, transplants in order to correct either monogenic disorders, so disorders caused by a single gene defect where if we introduce cells that have the normal gene, in many cases, we can fix the underlying disease and cure it. We're a pioneer in that here. We've made deep investments in building out those programs here, as well as bringing the very latest therapies such as CAR T cell therapies to cancer patients who need them, both children and adult. So we're trying to cover the entire spectrum from prevention of diseases that we know are related to poor access to care or, or failure to access a normal food chain, for example, to address those issues as well as address the most complicated diseases in children that we now can approach and in many cases treat and cure in ways that were impossible just very recently. I have a few more questions, but we have a couple audience questions. Um, what is the process when new disease modifying therapies are available in order to change precision medicine? When there are so many different groups involved, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease. When well, Alzheimer's disease, the it certainly is a challenging disease. The neurodegener neurodegenerative diseases are one of the areas where we really need to advance our fundamental understanding of the pathology of the disease. In other words, what causes the disorder? There are a number of therapeutics that are being in, that are in trials today. We participate in, in many of those. We're also very much engaged in doing the fundamental discovery focused research that I think ultimately will one day enable us to uh, have much more effective therapies and prevention for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. They are challenging diseases. And by and large today, the therapeutics we have available don't satisfy or please any of us. That's why we're constantly pushing to better understand the diseases and to develop better therapeutics. Okay. Another audience member question. Um, it came right in the beginning. You, it, some of this might have been answered, but are precision medicine decisions always based on genomics? What other factors besides genes play a major part? And when you answer that question, Dr. Miner, maybe you can weave in something we haven't talked about yet, but you talk about in the book, and that's gut health. You know, I, I don't know if that's too, if, if you can weave that in, because other than genomics, I think there's a lot of uh, other aspects in precision medicine um, that you can maybe dial down to certain secondary plant metabolites. And I mean, you know, precision medicine, always on genome. You know, what, it, what besides genomics do you really focus on in precision medicine? As we've discussed uh, already, a lot of the determinants of health right. are not related to our genetics. They're related to yes. social, behavioral, environmental factors. Mm -hmm. We need to increase our focus on those factors accompanied by our, our focus on genetics. If we look, for example, at the disparities in uh, the infection rate of COVID-19, and the disparities in terms of poor outcomes among communities of color, those disparities are mainly related to social and environmental factors. Genetics may play some role, but it, the reason why people of color are disproportionately being affected in the United States has more to do with them being frontline workers, with them living in communities in households that don't allow them to isolate from a person who is positive. Those are more of the important reasons for 
the higher infection rate and the poorer outcomes than the genetic predispositions or the genetic factors. Not to say for a moment that we should turn our back on understanding those factors, because ultimately understanding those factors will enable us to develop better, better therapeutics and also more effective vaccines in individual cohorts of people. But social, behavioral, environmental factors are extremely important and I think need to receive the same degree of attention that genetic factors have received in the past uh, since we mapped the human genome and have appropriately been focused on applying that knowledge of the mapping of the human genome. So what is a citizen scientist that you, you talk about in the book? What is that? And, and can we all be one? Well, I really, one of the things I loved about preparing this book and writing this book over the past of, over the past couple of years that I was involved in writing it, it is it enabled me to tell the stories of our faculty. I, I will also mention that all the proceeds uh, from the sale of the book go to Stanford, um, none to me personally. Oh. And I felt that was important because this really is, as you indicated before, Patty, it's a story about Stanford people. And one of the stories that I tell there is, is a wonderful faculty member, Dr. Riju Das, who's a professor in the biochemistry department. And Riju, a number of years ago, started um, a nonprofit company called Eterna to use gaming to discern RNA structure, the structure of RNA, uh, one of the nucleic acids involved in our genetic material and in, in, in transmitting the genetic code and enabling protein to be, be made from the genetic code. RNA has a very complex structure, hard to elucidate. And Riju reasoned that we could get gamers, he could get gamers uh, to be able to uh, hypothesize on RNA structures, to be able to take information, existing information that's available and predict the structure of, of RNA. And then that he could test these structures in his lab Eterna now has found a new meaning because the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. And one of the vaccines that being moved forward today, the Materna vaccine, is an RNA-based vaccine. One of the problems with using nucleic acids for vaccines is that nucleic acids are unstable. They can be hard to stabilize. Riju has been focusing his group of gamers on the structure of the RNA in the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how that structure could be changed, preserving the genetic makeup, but changing the structure so that it would be more stable and therefore so that it might drive the production of a vaccine that would be more stable. Riju has, has had scientific papers come out from the work of people, their competitions. They gather virtually to talk about the work they're doing. But it's such a wonderful story of empowering individuals anywhere in the world uh, to be able to contribute to science. And many people are actively engaged and doing brilliant, brilliant work. And I tell the story of some of them in the book. Yeah, yeah the, um, the one man, oh, I can't remember all the details, but it was a, it was a fascinating, and again, I'll give the pitch and uh, the book another pitch here, the story of the citizen scientist that, you know, he just did it. He was having a blast and he was making a, a big difference and it, it's, it's a fun story to read. So um, finally, uh, if you would summarize Stanford's in, important work with precise medical therapies, the chapter seven in your book, perhaps it's relevant today, uh, to talk about persistent threats to treatment of infectious diseases. And of course, your book came out before COVID. <laughs> so um, if you would uh, t talk about persistent threats. And like you said earlier, this is not the last pandemic we're going to have. So um, if you would tell us about that, what's Stanford doing with infectious diseases and looking forward? Certainly with COVID-19, I'm so pleased that our donor community really stepped up and our faculty stepped up in many cases to pivot their research from what they had been working on to working on the SARS-CoV-2 virus or the disease it, it, it causes, COVID-19. I mentioned Riju Das who pivoted Eterna to really focusing on the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We have people who study human immunology who pivoted to study the immune response to this virus. We were able to build 
a facility to work with the virus safely, a so-called BSL-3 facility. All of this enabled by donors who want to make a difference, who want to enable our faculty to make a difference. And in the end, that's what it's about. It's about enabling, empowering the brilliant people in our faculty, the students, the staff, to do their very best science and to have the impact we know they're capable of having. Two things that I would mention um, coming out of COVID-19 that I hope are permanent changes. First is that the science of virology and, uh, and of emerging infectious diseases, viruses and bacteria, that science had not received the focus in the past that it needs to receive in the future. It's receiving it now. I hope it doesn't recede once we, uh, once we uh, cure SARS-CoV-2 and, uh, and eradicate it. We have to maintain a focus on virology and understanding the virus, viruses and emerging infectious diseases. Second is that vaccinology or the production of vaccines, novel methods for the production of vaccines also had not received the attention until COVID-19 that it needs to receive. Now, of course, there are eight uh, vaccine candidates entering to phase two, three trials. That's great to have multiple shots on goal, but we have to make sure that emphasis doesn't go away, that we keep a steady scientific and technological emphasis on the development of novel vaccines. We know that there are going to be more pathogens jump from animals to humans in the future. The mobility that exists in the world today, global warming, all of these are factors that are contributing to the transmission of infections from animals to humans. And we're being incredibly naive if we think that COVID-19 is a one-off. And being prepared in the future, I think, is a major responsibility and goal for all of us. Yeah, I, absolutely. Well, I could come up with many more questions. You, it, it was a fascinating book. I enjoyed it. So I think this has been enlightening and, and very impressive. And Stanford is quite obviously at the forefront of medical research and innovation. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Miner, for joining us um, today. It's been interesting. And I'd like to thank everyone who's listening today. And remember that the Commonwealth Club, you can go to commonwealthclub.org and you can donate and you can uh, share this um, program and join us for many more in the future. So thank you so much and um, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Patty.